Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, sitting in for Barbara Altman. Our guest today is writer and renegade naturalist Doug Peacock. He spent the por past 40 years wandering the Earth's wildest places, studying grizzly bears and advocating for the preservation of wilderness. Peacock served two tours as a Green Beret combat medic during the Vietnam War. He was a close friend of revered militant environmentalist and author Edward Abbey and served as an inspiration for Abbey's character, George Washington Hey Duke in the Monkey Ranch Gang. Peacock is the author of Grizzly Years, In Search of the American Wilderness, Baja, and Walking It Off, A Veteran's Chronicle of War and Wilderness. His latest book, co-written with his wife, Andrea Peacock, is The Essential Grizzly, The Mingled Fates of Men and Bears. He was a 2007 Guggenheim Fellow and a 2011 Lennon <coughs> Fellow for his work on a new book about archaeology climate change, and the peopling of North America. Peacock gave a talk titled The Greatest Adventure, A Survivor's Guide to a Melting Century on March 6, 2012, as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2011-12 Robert D. Clark Lecturer. His talk was part of the year-long conflict series. Doug, welcome to UO Today. Thanks, Thanks so Paul. much for taking the time to speak with us. Can I ask you to begin by reading a short passage uh, from Walking It Off, your most recent book? The uh, passage that I'm, I'm, I'd like you to read is uh, the description of the burial of Edward Abbey. Uh -huh. so Aha. No, I've got it here. I'm just taking a deep breath. Okay. You know, I, I, uh, uh, the, the, this is the most abbreviated chapter in the book, and for good reason. You know, we just had to get it done. Anyway, <coughs> Ed. Um, Ed uh, didn't want to die in a hospital, and uh, uh, the doctors had really messed up his diagnosis. They told him that he had uh, two months to live because he had acute pancreatitis, or cancer of the pancreas, um, five years before he actually died. In fact, he never had any of that. He had a curable ganglia that that uh, imitated portal hyper. It gave him a portal hypertension, mm -hmm. you know, which is like cirrhosis, and he actually died of those veins. But at the last time I went in to see Ed in the hospital, he looked at me with the clearest eyes I ever saw and said, Douglas, get me the hell out of here. And he pulled out all the tubes, and so we drove him out to the desert, uh, and he was going fast, and uh, we were going to take him out to a nice place to die. And at the railroad tracks, Clark, who was in front of me, his wife pulled over and said, Doug, he's going fast. So we took him to a different place. And, uh, and uh, you know, just before daylight, just in the outskirts of Tucson. But it's a place I used to go out. I used to go out and camp by myself there just to get out, you know. And uh, not a bad place to die. And so Ed got in a sleeping bag. And, and uh, uh, first I built him a little fire, you know, a little, little campfire out of mesquite. And he was sitting in a chair. Uh, and looked at fire for oh, 20 minutes till he got a little tired. Then he decided he was ready to die, so he got in a sleeping bag. And uh, Clark got in a sleeping bag with him, and uh, we waited. We waited, and, and you know, finally the sun started to creep up, and I went over to see if you know he, he was he was gone yet. And he looked at me and he said, "Douglas, sometimes the magic doesn't work." <laughs> But anyway, he did die a couple of days later, and here's a story of, uh, of uh, I haven't read this in so long, I have to kind of remember. I think it might be the previous page. That's why it's awkward. Here, Here we go. go. Right Got it. Out. Yeah. Um, so Ed's dead. He's packed in a sleeping bag in dry ice, in a body bag, in the back of a pickup, and we're roaring out through the desert country of southern Arizona. Then it was back to the desert country of southwest Arizona. That harsh, dry region we all loved. The most important thing Ed Abbey and I ever shared, the Cabeza Prieta. We drove through washes lined with mesquite and desert willow, over creosote-studded bajadas, past Choya and Ironwood, driving west with Ed packed in dry ice in the bed of the truck. The sun was low on the horizon. Towards the west, the colors of sunset clashed with the absolute black and white expanse of basaltic boulders peppered by ghostly brittle bush. As far as the eye could see, distant ranges a hundred miles into the setting sun, there was not a human sign, no roads, trails, or power lines. Only the faint evening breeze stirred in this landscape. In the fitting light, Steve, Jack, Tom, and I, those are my three comrades that helped me bury Ed, uh, his brother-in-law, his father-in-law, 
and Jack Leffler. Um, anyway, the, the, the four of us gathered around a hole, dug into a rise overlooking a great valley, taking turns at pickaxing the steel-hard caliche desert soil. Nearby, under the thin shade of a saguaro cactus, lay a body bag camouflaged by an army poncho liner. The digging proved impossible because of a limestone cap rock, and we had to give up and seek out another place to lay our friend to rest. I was having an ominous argument with Jack over what I considered the execution of Abby's last request concerning the gravesite. Jack was my good friend, but this has not been an easy week. And Ed, Ed's written burial instructions were, I thought, quite explicit. The next day, I found exactly the right place to plant old Ed. The desert air seemed charged with a rare crisp purity. Though illegal grave digging is urgent business, I nonetheless seized the moments between the shovel scoop to savor this last day on earth with my friend. Steve dug away, and finally, I lay down in a freshly dug grave to make certain it was suitable. The 10 circling buzzards confirmed my choice. There was three buzzards finally joined by seven others, all circling the hole. Ed wanted to be reincarnated as a buzzard, you know, so that was important. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I felt good, comfortable with our collective duty to Ed. I looked over the desert vastness around me and picked out a dozen possible walking routes to unknown destination, the currency of adventure. We carried Ed's body over the rugged ground, and I was shocked at how light he seemed, light as a cloud, mist on a hill. He might have flown away. During the previous days, I had developed a confusing attitude concerning the dead, an outlook perhaps bordering on madness, but partly understandable concerning the circumstances. The lines between death and life blurred for me. I wasn't sure the dead would stay dead. They might just get up and walk away or disappear. When no one was looking, I gently felt Ed's nose through the body bag just to make sure he was still in there. That Ackland Abbey beak was there all right. He hadn't gone anywhere. I had to do this several times secretly to reassure myself. We lowered Ed into the hole. It went quickly. I picked up a black vulture feather for an offering, but there was no time for ceremony. The four of us were not of one mind, nor were we all entirely comfortable with the job. After all, this was a legal transport of a body, not officially certified as dead. We were trespassing without permits on lands where it was illegal to enter anyone. The dirt was caved back in and covered with natural boulders that were carefully placed with the patina side up and the caliche stains down. It was done. The real Hayduke was buried. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. What do you miss about Edward Abbey? You know, that stern, angry voice that was so steady in defense of the wild. You know, uh, when Ed, Ed Abbey died, I thought there'd be hundreds of, you know, spokesmen and writers coming out to fill those big, toothy, lecherous shoes, you know? But for whatever reason, they didn't. They didn't come. They're not filled. And he's a voice that we need as much today as we did 40 years ago. And, uh, you know, um, that's what I miss the most. And that's why I spend quite a lot of time just promoting, promoting his work. Because, you know, this generation really needs an Ed Abbey. And they don't happen to have one at hand. And uh, uh, Desert Solitaire, I recently wrote an introduction for, uh, oh, it's a French edition, you know. And, uh, um, but I went back to that book, and I was amazed how current it is. It foretells everything, you know, uh, nuclear doomsday, global warming, all that stuff is in that book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he tells us, you know, he tells us that the, maybe the only thing worth saving is wilderness. And he tells us it's not just enough to admire and, and use the wild. We've got to be prepared to defend it every day. And uh, that's what I miss most from my friend. I mean, you've, you've implied a couple of things. What do you think about the contemporary environmental movement? Well, we're so tragically outgunned, you know, it's, it's, it's piteous. Uh, the people are not piteous, however, and it's up to every one of us to fight like hell because this is the only life we have that we're going to have, and things do not look rosy. I mean, this, this thing I call the beast of our time, 
which is climate change. You know, the catchword is global warming. You know, which more accurately is the, are the extremes of weather, the mm -hmm. floods, the freezes, everything. Those are the big enchiladas of, of climate change. But um, you know, it's going to affect the certainly directly the lives and the duration of the lives of my grandchildren, if I ever have any. And uh, um, and yet, it, it, you know, climate change is something that happens incrementally at great distances to strangers we don't even know. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're so comfortable here and with all our material comforts and, you know, economic insulation that uh, things are good for now. And, uh, um, you know, there's no place to see lion in the bush. We were evolved to perceive risk. I, I really see it as a matter of perception of risk. And for whatever reason, modern people uh, do not perceive what's in their own vested interest for long-term survival. And I, I mean physical survival even. We, we just don't get it. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I, in my new work, I just I kind of went back to the Pleistocene. You know, we were evolved to see the saber tooth in the bush. And we get that. Well, here is something bigger than a saber tooth, and uh, we're just uh, we're not even waving hankies at it. And uh, you know, collectively, you know, I think w I think you know, collectively, we should be ashamed. It's a pathetic effort, and uh, you know, our 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 fellow human beings, uh, other countries are doing a better job than ours doing. And and I'm very ashamed of the effort of this country to lead that charge. Many current um, militant environmentalists draw inspiration from Abby's example and his work, especially the Monkey Wrench Gang and the character of George Washington Haydew. <coughs> How do you feel about those environmentalists being labeled as terrorists? Well, I think it's bullshit, okay? Um, you know, uh, Defending the wilderness, and you know, and and quite frankly, these people explicitly state that you know they're not, they're not endangering life. Sometimes you go after property as a matter of civil disobedience, you know, and as Abby would say, you know, if if if, if an armed thug came into your house, what would you do? Well, you should, uh, you know, the native home of our species is the wilderness. That's where all our evolution took place, where, the, where this fine thing we call our mind evolved, you know. It didn't evolve in cities and farms. It evolved in a habitat, essentially the same habitat, whose remnants today we call the wilderness. And fighting to protect that is, uh, you know, the most honorable uh, uh, warrior-like assignment one can, one can enlist for. And I commend them all. How much time do you spend in the wilderness? I go out, well, I have to spend, I, I, I basically I go out somewhere every day by myself. It, it, you know, I, I, uh, I'm a nomad. I've never really had a homing instinct. I've had wives, children, needed houses, pets, dogs, cats, and you know, that certain anchors. But my, my polar world, a pretty much grizzly country, when the grizzlies are out, and the desert, which I lo also love. I love the American West. I love the continent of North America. And uh, so, you know, currently I'm, uh, you know, I'm squatted down in southern Arizona. And, and you know, I'm still full-time working on a bloody albatross of a buck that I can't quite get off my back. But I get out every day. I go out you know, on the public lands and, you know, I'll drive a truck out there and get out and just walk down a wash or up in the hills, up in the mountains. And, you know, and I, in Montana, I built a house for my wife a couple of years ago that's about 30 miles north of Yellowstone. It's in the Yellowstone Valley. And, I, you know, every day, I, you know, every day I at least go to the river, if not Yellowstone, and walk around. And when I, you know, when I can break off, I'll, I'll take, uh, you know, I go out and just camp. Sometimes I go by myself. My last best trips have been with my family, my, uh, my, my, my son Colin, my daughter Laurel, and I went up to Glacier and just camped in a beautiful trailless uh, wilderness valley in Glacier Park. No permits, no rangers, no signs, no trails. You know, it's, Abby would have liked it too. Nothing but bears and wolves. And the wolves are watching the setup camp. And my daughter looks over there and she calls me Bappy. She says, Bappy, I think that's a wolf over there. And, you know, yeah, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> 
And uh, you know, and 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 so we do. You know, we uh, I do that. We just got back from Costa Rica, again, my wife and my two growing children. So, th those are you know, in the old days, solitude was probably the most important thing for me, and I indulged myself in it. I took weeks upon months by myself. I, I've hiked across the Cabeza Prieta end to end seven times, and that's like 140 miles. It takes you 10 days. And I, I never, you know, I, n I never saw a human being, except once I ran into Clark and Ed Abbey out there, believe it or not. <laughs> they weren't walking, they were trucking. <laughs> but, you know, uh, with a family, y uh, y y the, the trips are by myself are shorter, and it's usually one or two nights out, but I, I couldn't live without it. And I, I need that bear, and I need that desert fix. So how did you become engaged with the Grizzlies? Oh, I just, you know, I, I, got, out of, I got out of Vietnam in 1968 after, uh, I was, a, like you said, I was a, a Green Beret uh, medic. And I put in a couple tours, stayed a few months after the Tet Offensive, which was a terrible, terrible time. And, uh, uh, the short story is, uh, you know, I, I handled too many dead children. That's what broke me down. And by the time I got back, like commonly, like uh, many other Vietnam vets, you know, I t terribly out of sorts. I didn't want to be with my own kind. I was estranged from my family, my culture. Always have been, and still am. But uh, you know, just. And the only thing I uh, was really comfortable doing is going and camping out because I'm very comfortable by myself and in the wilderness. My father was a Boy Scout guy and raised me that way, and you know, in the lakes and creeks and swamps of Michigan. And so when I went back, I just started uh, going out, and uh, you know, I was down in Arizona, and the snow melted, and I was up to Utah and the Wind Rivers, and I had a malaria attack. Went to Yellowstone and. I ran into grizzlies. I wasn't looking for them, um, but I ran into them, and boy, they do get your attention. And at that time, probably more than anything else I needed was, you know, was the absence of self-indulgence. Self-indulgence is literally impossible in grizzly country because there's someone out there, you know, who, if it chooses, can kill and eat you any time it wants. And I found that a very healthy psychic orientation. Say a little bit more about what it feels like to be in the presence of a grizzly. <clears throat> you know, it, it, it's the biggest human world of all. You, you, you are now a part of the primal world, you know, the genesis of, of our species. When we lived, you know, when we maybe shouldered a spear, but we walked upright through uh, an avenue of great, beautiful omnivores and predators that could kill and eat us any time they wanted to. And you know, you are not, um, so being at the top of the food chain is not on your mind in the least. You know, you know where you are and uh, what you occupy, you know, you're sort of a mid-level uh, uh, pork chop, actually, is what you are. And uh, you, your relationship to the world is, is, is uh, colored by that perception, you know? and you know, you see better, you hear better, you pay attention to what the other animals are saying, especially birds and things like that. And uh, I think it, you know, above all, it is a posture of humility because, you know, because you are not the top dog, you can't diddy bop down the trail with your Celtic pack thinking about your girlfriend or rock and roll and, you know, th th how the job sucks. Uh, you know, you really have uh, more important things on your mind, and that is healthy. Um, how's the status of grizzlies changed since you've been studying them? Well, it's it's not better, okay? And you know, it's 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 uh, when I started championing grizzly bears, there were probably two or three grizzly bear advocates in the whole world. Now, now you got a small committee for every bear that's left, so. You know, <laughs> that's one thing. But, you know, it, what a grizzly's bear needs more than any other animal on this, well, not, you know, but they need roadless wild habitat. And it's not because they can't get along with us. They could, but we are so intolerant that, you know, we're, we are so fearful of the unknown, and largely the whole of nature is something we don't know anymore, uh, that they're, you know, they're killed by humans. You know, human mortality 
and of course last lo loss of habitat. So anytime, you know, up in Grizzly Country, up in Kalispell, anytime there's you know more redneck development and strip malls, you know that's that's habitat the bears need, not just for food but also for corridors to move. Now with global warming really affecting dramatically uh, the bears south of Canada. You know, especially in Yellowstone, where it's killed off probably 97 percent of all the white bark pine, who is not as the most important food source for Yellowstone grizzlies. So that's a huge thing. But you know, um, they're going to need to move. Like you know, all species are going to move up, down, or north. You know, accommodate changing climates. Your newest book you wrote with your wife Andrea asserts that the fate of bears and humans are mingled. How? How are they mingled? Be I. It's just a it's a it's a hunch I've had all my adult life, and I just I, I think that if we are not big enough human beings to grant those bears that little piece of quarter they need to live their lives, and they need wild country to live their lives on, if we can't allow the bears to do that, we're sure as hell not going to save ourselves. You know, I mean, you know, wh wh what is it? You know, wh what is the world going to take to you know? We're going to have to have some kind of empathy for, you know, the children of some Bangladesh farmer. Ultimately, you got to uh, that has got to enter the formula. And if we're not big enough to save those last bears, but on all kinds of levels, I feel you know the grizzly bear and human beings. You know, the, the animal most like a human being is really the bear, especially the grizzly bear. I mean, they stand up right, they have binocular vision, they snore and they sleep, they cuff their kids when they mess up. Uh, you know, the human foot, you know, the rear print of a bear, very like human. And uh, they've, uh, they've been with us, you know, since the grizzly bear and human beings really evolved together. You know, first at brown bear and uh, brown bears over in Europe with Neanderthals and Homo erectus and Homo sapien. But in this continent in particular, the m two most recent big critters to cross the Bering Straits were grizzly bears about 50, nobody knows, 50, 60,000 years ago. And in human beings, probably 30,000 years ago. But, you know, we came over. Everywhere humans went, they followed the tracks of brown bear, of grizzly bears. And where did grizzly bears live in the American West? The same places, you know, Native Americans lived. And, you know, in California, the archaeology proves that out. We eat the same foods. We're omnivores. We eat exactly the same foods. We live in the same places. And, you know, I could go on, but you know the essence is yes, they are mingled. What has to happen to save the grizzlies and our remaining wilderness? Well, I, we have to perceive how badly we need these animals, and how badly for you know for ourselves we need wild country in general. But uh, you know, it, as I said, uh, you know, uh, the human mind itself evolved in in a, in a habitat whose remnants are wilderness, and you know. It, 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 my idea is so simple it's simplistic, but you know, that which evolves doesn't persist without the conditions that gave rise to it. You know, and, and especially we're, we're, we're attacking a, 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 a brand new world, uh, you know, a fiery, terrifying world. And where are we going to, you know, where are we going to get the wisdom to make those necessary adaptions? You know, I don't think we're going to go. I was going to say sit in the library, but that would be a, the wrong thing to say at this moment. But you know <laughs> what I mean. I, I don't think we're going to get it by sitting in a coffee house. I think you go get it on a mountaintop. Can I sh shift gears a little bit? Um, Please. How did your experience in Vietnam shape your views about the wilderness? <sighs> I think it's quite, you know, the analogy is probably pretty simple. You know, I saw the industrial forces of destruction, killing innocent people in Vietnam, you know, torching villages, you know, bombing to death mountains and rice paddies, and especially killing innocent people. When I came back and I looked at the bulldozers working around, you know, say Tucson, Arizona, or the, you know, clear cuts in the open mines of the Northern Rockies, the same industrial forces of greed, you know, matched the killing machine I saw in Vietnam. And it really wasn't much of a transition for me, you know, to fight against both. Do you have any guidance or advice that you'd offer young veterans returning from our latest wars? <coughs> um, <coughs> <coughs> I 
I would, <clears throat> I would recommend that uh, that they. Uh, <clears throat> and I give this advice to young people in general, but you know, I think it's important to spend some time alone in wild places. Now, you know, the wildest place you can feel comfortable in might just be your backyard, but I think you should go to that wildest place that you feel comfortable and spend some time. And uh, sometimes you just sit and look around and uh, look at the ants. And, and uh, you know, the key, I think, uh, is humility before nature. Well, I had a, a good friend, that, you know, get it in his backyard, and I have to go to far-flung places in the globe for me. But, you know, there's all kinds of, kinds of uh, gradients there. But, uh, you know, going, you need, you know, like I, I, I believe, like Ed Abbey did. I've, it's a writer's duty to be a critic of his culture, of his society. And I think it's a soldier's duty to come back and use some of that wisdom to look in at his own culture and society. And the quickest, quickest exit from our own culture, I think, uh, for me, it's, it's easy. Go out into the wilderness, you know? It's, it's a layer that floats above culture. And in a day or two, you become really part of it in a pretty organic, easy way. And, uh, you know, you won't like everything you see down there, but, you know, you're able to, to speak your mind clearly and maybe act upon it. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today and for your wisdom. Um, it's been great speaking with well, you. Thanks, Paul. We've been speaking with Doug Peacock. He's a writer, naturalist, grizzly bear expert, and wilderness advocate. He's the author of Grizzly <coughs> Years in Search of the American Wilderness, Baja, and Walking It Off, A Veteran's Chronicle of War and Wilderness. His latest book, co-written with his wife Andrea Peacock, is The Essential Grizzly, The Mingled Fates of Men and Bears. Peacock gave a, a talk titled The Greatest Adventure, A Survivor's Guide to the Melting Century on March 6, 2012, as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2011-2012 Robert D. Clark Lecturer. His talk was part of the year-long conflict series. Thank you for watching. <laughs>